sickness, whether physical or spiritual. Lord, we pray that we will be able to help any and all that are suffering in some way. And Lord, we pray that those that are spiritually ill, that they will come back to us and, and soften their hearts and return to you. Lord, we pray that those in our family that do not know you, our friends, our family that have not obeyed you, we pray that we will find every opportunity to have the courage to teach them your word and your will so that they can have that opportunity to know you and obey you before it's too late. Lord, we thank you for all the blessings you give us in this life. We pray that you will continue to bless us as you see fit. Lord, we pray that we will always love you and respect you and study your word and apply it in wisdom as we walk the journey in this life and prepare for our heavenly home. We pray, Lord, that we will never turn our backs on you. Lord, we thank you for this country that we live in. We know there are many in this country that give up their freedom, their time, their family, so that we have the freedom to worship you. And we thank you for them. Lord, we thank you for those that have given their lives so that we can have this freedom. Lord, we especially thank you for your son Jesus that has given his life to give us a hope of heaven. It's in his name we pray.
also preserved for you. The Lord Jesus on the same night when she was betrayed to a bear. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take to eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The same man he took the cup after supper, saying, Take this cup is the new cup, my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death to the cup.
in Esther chapter 2, 17. <clears throat> And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Thank you for scripture reading, Brother Jerry. This morning we're going to look at the concept of God's providence through the book of Esther. And at the beginning of the book of Esther, here we're in the days of, and this king's name is a little bit hard to pronounce, but uh, Osiris, I'll say, uh, probably not right, but he was king of Persia at the time, in the days between the building of the temple and the wall of Jerusalem, Israel was in a time of great peril. They were in captivity. The very existence of their nation was at stake, as we'll find out as we read through here. But as we will see, God, through his providence, will save Israel from destruction. What is God's providence? It is the preservation, care, uh, which God exercises over all things that he created in order that they may accomplish the ends for which they were created. God's providence employs no miracles. Instead, God uses the natural laws of our world to accomplish his will. Things that seem to happen by accident may have happened by providence. Now, one thing that we might mention before we begin is not everything is providence. We might think everything is providence, but not everything is by providence. But let's begin with the historic account of Esther here. So, uh, the king, Osiris, after coming home from conquering all of Asia, throws a little bit of a party here, um, an expensive party that lasts 104 days. If you would, let's take a look at Esther chapter 1. We're going to read the first few verses here. Beginning in verse 1 of Esther chapter 1. Now it came to pass in the days of Osiris, this is... Osiris, which reigned from India even unto Ethiopia, over a hundred and seven and twenty provinces, that in those days when the king Osiris sat on the throne of his kingdom, which was in Shushan, the palace. Now, this palace was located north of the, uh, I'm trying to remember now, uh, it's between the Caspian Sea and I believe the Arabian Sea, if I remember correctly, but... Uh, it's to the east of Babylon. In the third year of his reign, he made a feast unto all his princes and his servants, the power of Persia and Media, the nobles and princes of the provinces being before him. When he showed the riches of his glories, king, glorious kingdom, and the honor of his excellent and majesty, or excellent majesty, many days, even a hundred and fourscore days. And when these days were expired, the king made a feast unto all the people that were present in Shushan, the palace, both unto great and small, seven days in the court of the garden of the king's palace, where were white, white green, and blue hangings, fastened with cords of fine linen and purple, to silver rings and pillars of marble. The beds were of gold and silver, upon a pavement of red and blue and white and black marble. And they gave them drink in vessels of gold, the vessels being diverse one from another, and royal wine in abundance, according to the state of the king. And the drinking was according to the law. None did compel, for so the king 
had appointed to all the officers of his house that they should do according to every man's pleasure. So the king is throwing this little party to show how much riches he has. This is kind of arrogant. He wants everybody to know his power, his authority. And back in those days, it was no different than it is today. If you have a lot of money, you have a lot of power. And so he wanted to show that off. Uh, this kind of arrogance uh, is really kind of disgusting to people who don't have that kind of money and kind of power, especially when they show it off like that. Um, I went to an academic meet yesterday, and there's this one school that uh, is always dominant every time we go. And when we, before we even started the turn the round, uh, they came in and just started bragging about all of their accomplishments before we ever even started. And every time we had a question and we got one wrong, they wanted to answer it to get it right for us. So they just wanted to show us how smart they were. Um, and this kind of arrogance just doesn't sit well with people. And this is kind of what's going on here with this king is he's showing off. So when Osiris had become drunken, he calls for his wife, who was very beautiful, to parade around in front of all of those gathered. This is verses 9 through 12. We're not going to go through and read all of these because it'll take up too much time. But this is uh, Vashti, his wife. Evidently, Osiris wanted his wife to parade around in front of these men naked, or fear so, so that they might see what a good figured woman he had. Vashti refused. Let's take a look at verse 12. But the queen, Vashti, refused to come at the king's commandment by his chamberlains. Therefore was the king very wroth, and his anger burned in him. She decided she was not going to put up with this. Let's read uh, verses 13 through 22 here. Then the king said to the wise men, which knew the times... For so was the king's manner toward all that knew law and judgment. And the next unto him was Karshina, Shephra, or Shethar, Admatha, Tarshish, Miris, Marsana, and Mamukin, the seven princes of Persia and Media, which saw the king's face, and which sat the first in the kingdom. What shall we do unto the queen Vashti, according to law, because she hath not performed the commandment of the king, Osiris, by the chamberlains. These princes are wanting to know what to do. And Mimikin answered before the king and the princes, Vashti the queen hath not done wrong to the king only, but also to all the princes and to all the people that are in all the provinces of the king, Osiris. For these, this deed of the queen shall come abroad unto all women, so that they shall despise their husbands in their eyes when it shall be reported. The king Osiris commanded Vashti, the queen, to be brought in before him, but she came not. Likewise shall the ladies of Persia and Media say this day unto all the king's princes, which have heard of the deed of the queen, thus shall there arise too much contempt and wrath. If it please the king, let there go a royal commandment from him, and let it be written among the laws of the Persians and the Medes, that it be not altered, that Vashti come not come no more before King Osiris, and let the king give her royal estate unto another that is better than she. And when the king's decree which he shall make shall be published throughout all his empire, for it is great, all the wives shall give to their husbands honor, both to great and small. And the same pleased the king and the princes, and the king did according to the word of Mimicon. For he sent letters into all the king's provinces, into every province, according to the writing thereof, and to every people after their language, that every man should bear rule in his own house, and that it should be published according to the language of every people. So this prince has a little bit of an idea. And he says, well, first of all, the queen hasn't done just wrong to the king, 
but she's done wrong to every man in the kingdom because now all the women are going to do the same thing to their husbands. And the New Testament kind of tells us the same thing, right? That husbands should be in charge and husbands should rule over their wives this way. No, it doesn't. Um, actually, it tells us that we should care for our wives and take care of our wives and shouldn't be this way to our wives. And Vashti had a little bit of honor in what she did in refusing. And so the prince here tells the king, kind of tricks him and says, let's make this decree. Because the, the king's decree in the Medes and the Persians law was the same as in Babylon, where if the king makes this decree, it's permanent. It can't be changed. And so it is done. The king makes the decree, sends it out, and it's settled. And so she is no longer going to be queen. She's going to be removed as queen. So later, after Osiris, his anger is pacified, he begins to miss the company of a woman and begins to search for a new queen in chapter 2, verses 1 through 15. So the virgin maidens are brought before the king, and Esther catches his eye. And Esther is going to be made queen. Let's look at verse 17 again, which we looked at as our scripture reading of chapter 2. And the king loved Esther above all the women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins, so that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Now, we have two turning points in this uh, example of providence here. First, Vashti refused to do what the king wanted. She made a choice and said, no, we're, I'm not going to do this. And that made it to where she was no longer going to be queen. And here, it opened up a place for Esther, who was a Jew, to be queen over the Medes and the Persians. So when Esther was queen, Mordecai, Mordecai is the man who became her adopted father, uh, uncovered a plot to kill the king. Let's take a look at verses 19 through 23 of chapter 2 here. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not yet showed her kindred nor her people as Mordecai had charged her, for Esther did the commandment of Mordecai, like as when she was brought up with him. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Turish, of those which kept the door, were wroth and sought to lay hand on the king, Osiris. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Esther the queen, and Esther certified the king thereof in Mordecai's name. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out thereof they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles before the king. So Mordecai uncovered this plot to kill the king, made it known, and the plotters were hung. And so we're going to find out that this comes back a little bit later on. Esther tells the king on Mordecai's behalf here, Mordecai's deed was written and recorded in the king's chronicle, and that's important that it um, is recorded there. Haman, which is um, one of the uh, servants of the king, he's promoted to a high position in the kingdom, and the king makes a decree that all should bow in reverence to him. Let's take a look at chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. After these things, after the death of these plotters, did King Osiris promote Haman, the son of Hamandatha, the Agagite, and advanced him, and set his seat above all the princes that were with him. And all the king's servants that were in the king's gate bowed and reverenced Haman. For the king had so commanded concerning him, but Mordecai bowed not, and did him, nor did him reverence. So Mordecai did not follow the king's decree. He refused to do reverence. Haman hates the Jews because of this. Let's take a look at chapter 3, verse 6. He doesn't just hate Mordecai. He hates all the Jews. Verse 6, 
and thought scorn to lay hands on Mordecai alone, for they had showed him the people of Mordecai. Wherefore Haman sought to destroy all the Jews that were throughout the whole kingdom of Osiris, even the people of Mordecai. So we see here that Haman is proud and self-reliant. Many are like Haman today. They will hate a whole race because of what one man does. Haman goes to the king to get revenge in chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. Let's look at uh, verses 8 and 9 here of chapter 3. And Haman said unto King Osiris, There is a certain people scattered abroad and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of thy kingdom. And their laws are diverse from all people, neither keep they the king's laws, therefore it is not for the king's profit to suffer them. If it please the king, let it be written that they may be destroyed, and I will pay ten thousand talents of silver to the hands of those that have the charge of the business, to bring it into the king's treasuries. And the king took his ring from his hand, and gave it unto Haman the son of Hamadath, the Agagite, the Jews' enemy. So again, if the king makes a decree, it's permanent. It cannot be changed. So here we see in verses 8 and 9 and verse 10 that uh, this decree is made. A law is established. Um, this was possible, uh, possibly done to ensure that the laws were not made haphazardly as far as the king's laws not being overturned. The extermination of the Jews is decreed in verses 12 through 15. Haman said he would pay for this out of his own pocket. Uh, we saw in verse 9. Let's look at verse 13. And the letters were sent by post into all the king's provinces to destroy, to kill, and to cause to perish all Jews, both young and old, little children and women, in one day, even upon the thirteenth day of the twelfth month, which is the month Adar, and to take the spoil of them for a prey. This is how much Haman hated these people. One, he was willing to pay out of his own pocket, but he was going to destroy women, children, everybody. He was willing to do that. And it probably wouldn't put it, put it past him to do it, some of it at his own hand. He hated them that much. Let's take a look at chapter 4. Verses 1 through 3, we're going to see here there's a great warning among the Jews, and rightfully so. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, when Mordecai perceived all that was done, Mordecai rent his clothes and put on sackcloth with ashes, and went out into the midst of the city and cried with a loud and a bitter cry, and came even before the king's gate, for none might enter into the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. And in every province, whithersoever the king's commandment, and his decree came, there was great mourning among the Jews, and fasting, and weeping, and wailing, and many lay in sackcloth and ashes. They were mourning because of this decree to destroy all the Jews. What would this extermination mean? Well, we have the promise of to Abraham, and this would become void. If all the Jews were wiped out at this point in time, we wouldn't have the Messiah. We wouldn't have a remnant. But God had promised a remnant. So that means something. Mordecai asks here for Esther to intercede. Let's take a look at verse 8. Also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her, and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication unto him, and to make requests before him for her people. But Esther gives a little bit of an excuse. Let's look at verse 11. All the king's servants and the people of the king's provinces do know that whosoever, whether man or woman, shall come unto the king into the inner court who is not called, there is one law of his, to put him to death, except such to whom the king shall hold out the golden scepter, that he may live. But I have not been called to come in unto the king these thirty days. 
She says there's a law that if you haven't been called to come before the king, you can be put to death. Unless you come in and he holds out the royal scepter, then you can be spared. But she hasn't been called. So she decides she doesn't want to go in. Let's take a look at verses 13 and 14. Then Mordecai commanded to answer Esther, Think not with thyself that thou shalt escape in the king's house more than all the Jews. For if thou altogether holdest thy peace at this time, then shall their enlargement and deliverance arise in the Jews from another place. But thou and thy father's house shall be destroyed, and who knoweth whether thou art come to this kingdom for such a time as this. How many times have people been in the right place at the right time in order to do the right thing, or have a choice to do the right thing? He's giving her a choice. He's saying, you may be in the right place at the right time to save all the Jews. And so she gives an answer. Let's take a look at verse 16. Go gather together all the Jews that are present in Shushan, and fast ye for me, and neither eat nor drink three days, night or day. I also and my maidens will fast likewise, and so will I go unto the king, which is not according to the law. And notice this, and if I perish, I perish. She's willing to give up her life for all the Jews in order for them to be saved. She's willing to save her people because she's in a position of power and in a position to do this thing. So Esther is going to petition the king in chapter five, verses one through eight. The king and Haman is now right-hand man here, are invited to a banquet where Esther will make her request. The banquet occurs, but Esther asks the king and Haman to come to another banquet where she will make her request. In the meantime, Haman is kind of excited. He's a little bit joyous because he's been given this special invitation of the queen. Let's take a look at Esther chapter 5, verse 9. Then went Haman forth that day joyful and with a glad heart. But when Haman saw Mordecai in the king's gate, that he stood not up nor moved for him, he was full of indignation against Mordecai. It's kind of interesting. Haman doesn't know the relationship between Mordecai and Esther. And he should know that Esther is a Jew, but it doesn't seem to face him. He's just glad that she's the queen. He's a little bit uh, caught up in the power here. Haman tells all of his friends and his wife about all these great things that are happening, but he's also caught up with Mordecai here. Verse 13, Yet all this availeth me nothing so long as I see Mordecai the Jew sitting at the king's gate. And verse 14, Then said Zeresh his wife and all his friends unto him, let a gallows be made of fifty cubits high, and tomorrow, tomorrow speak thou unto the king that Mordecai may be hanged thereon. Then go thou in merrily with the king unto the banquet. And the thing pleased Haman, and he caused the gallows to be made. So now we have another death plot being made against Mordecai. And again, it's like Haman knows nothing about what's going on. He's making his own little side plot. <laughs> And we're going to see that Haman is going to get something coming to him. So that night the king was unable to sleep. And he began to read the king's chronicles, chapter 6, and verse 1. He read where Mordecai had saved his life. And then asks of Mordecai, asked his servant, if Mordecai had been honored. Again, it was important that this historic event was recorded in the King's Chronicles. Because now the king is reading these chronicles and reads that his own life was saved by Mordecai. And he's asking, was Mordecai ever honored for this? And the servant tells him no. And about the time he's getting his answer, Haman comes into the court. Let's take a look at chapter 6, beginning of verse 6. So Haman came in. And the king said unto him, What shall be done unto the man whom the king delighteth to honor? Now Haman thought in his heart, To whom would the king delight to do honor more than to myself? And Haman answered,
answer the king for the man whom the king delighted to honor. Let the royal apparel be brought, which the king useth to wear, and the horse that the king rideth upon, and the crown royal, which is set upon his head. Let's pause for just a second. So the king has asked Haman, how shall I honor this person? He hasn't told him who yet. And so Haman gets a little bit cocky again, and he thinks, ah, he's going to honor me, so let me tell him what I think should happen. And so he's telling him all these great things. Verse 9, And let this apparel and horse be delivered to the hand of one of the king's most noble princes, and they may array the man with all whom the king delighteth to honor, and to bring him on horseback through the street of the city, and proclaim before him, Thus shall it be done to the man, whom the king delighteth to honor. Haman thinks he's setting himself up for greatness. But he's setting himself up for failure because in verse 12, he finds out that it's Mordecai that gets honored and not him. In fact, he gets it later. Uh, at the second banquet, Esther reveals Haman's plot. In chapter 7, verses 1 through 10, the king asks what Esther's request is. Let's take a look at verses seven, verse, uh, chapter 7, verses 3 through 6. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at, a, at my petition, and my people at my request. For we are sold, and I, my people, I and my people, uh, to be destroyed, to be slain, and to perish. But if we had been sold for bondmen and bondwomen, I had held my tongue, although the enemy could not countervail the king's damage. Then the king Osiris answered and said unto Esther the queen, Who is he, and where is he, that durst presume in his heart to do so? And Esther said, The adversary and enemy is this wicked Haman. Then Haman was afraid before the king and the queen. Now let's skip to verses 9 and 10, the end of this chapter. And Harman one of the chamberlains said before the king, Behold also the gallows, fifty cubits high, which Haman had made for Mordecai, who had spoken good for the king, standeth in the house of Haman. He had made for Mordecai, yeah, standeth in the house of Haman. Then the king said, Hang him thereon. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then was the king's wrath pacified. Haman got what he had prepared for Mordecai. Esther then cries on behalf of her people because of the mischief of Haman, chapter 8, verse 3. Osiris, because no law could be reversed, gives Esther and Mordecai the authority to make a counter decree in verse 8 of chapter 8. And so the Jews are given the authority to resist their enemies in chapter 8, verses 9 through 14. And the Jews are saved. Now, the name of God is not mentioned anywhere in the whole book of Esther. But yet God's providence is seen throughout the whole book. And we have the turning points. Today, though we cannot physically see God or any miracles, we see the result of his hand stretched out in providence. Esther was a Jew, became queen at the right time. And the right place. And Mordecai believed this. Chapter 4, verse 14. Vashti was removed, making room for Esther. Had Vashti not been a woman of integrity, things would have been a lot different. There would have been no place for Esther because Vashti would have still been queen. Mordecai saves the king's life, and this is recorded in the king's chronicle, who later is honored. No Esther, no saving of the king's life by Mordecai. No drunken king, no Vashti, no Esther. Then there was the king's sleepless night. Why couldn't he sleep? Why did he just happen to read the record of Mordecai saving his life and Haman coming in at the right time? Mordecai and Esther were in the right position at the right time to make a counter decree to save the Jews. Did God have anything to do with this? I think so. Man plays a part in providence as well. Again, some of it is mental, 
Not everything is providence, but it is faith. This is not a simple believing or wishing, but faith manifested in action, as we see in James chapter 2. Mordecai just didn't sit back and fret, but he went and did something. He tried to help, and Esther also helped. Mordecai asked, asked Esther to intervene, and so she did. And she was willing to make self-sacrifice. Again, she said, and if I perish, I perish. Many just want to sit back and expect everything to fall in their lap. But that's not the way it works with providence. We have to do our part and have faith in God. On a little personal note, I've been thinking about this lesson actually since July. And I'm just now bringing it. But I kind of think it might be providence that um, I started um, preaching a little bit more, not full time, but a little bit more, and later Joseph gets his diagnosis, because this has kept my mind focused and off of the negative side of things. And again, it's things like that that help us to draw closer to God. And the men asked me in the last meeting if I would um, continue on past January. And I have accepted. And who knows what the reasoning for that is. I don't know. Uh, but God allows things to happen for a reason. God's providence is working in our lives as it did with Esther's. And it allowed for the Jews to continue so that our Savior could come and we could have a hope of heaven. Do you still believe? We have to have that faith. This morning, the Lord's invitation is offered. If you are not a Christian, you can put Christ on in baptism. You first have to hear the word, believe that God has sent his son to die on the cross, that Jesus is the Son of God. Repent of your sins, confess your faith before men, be immersed in the waters of baptism, arising in newness of life, making that commitment to live faithful unto death. If you are a Christian, you've made that commitment, you've been baptized, but you've fallen away, and you need to come back to him. If you need to confess a public sin, Whatever your need may be, if you need prayers to the congregation, you can do all that as we come, as we stand.
song by uh, Patrick. Thank you. 